Hey, well, good morning. Good morning. If you can tell by my accent, I am from Brooklyn, so it's good to, it's good to be home. Um, today, we are going to talk about a soldier in the Bible. How many of you knew there, was a sold, there are soldiers in the Bible? There's a couple of them, and they actually fare pretty well. They fare better than most of religious leaders, which is encouraging for me because I'm both. So I am an active duty Army chaplain, and I've been doing that for 16 years. And um, thank you, did nothing to deserve that except to sign, sign up. I, I, so this is the thing that we, we struggle in our culture, like what do we do with soldiers? I'll get to that in just a moment. We're going to talk about Jesus encountering the centurion and what happens with that. And it's a defining moment in scripture. It's a defining moment in his life and in the lives of those that follow um, but I'm grateful to be talking about soldiers because it's one thing that I understand. So I've been, in, I've been in full-time ministry for 24 years, been on this earth for almost 45 years. And every year that accumulates, I realize how much it is I do not understand. I do not, I don't understand how the internet works. I mean, does it just blow your mind? Like I could turn on the phone, I can, I don't understand how it works. I don't understand how fax machines work. That's like even taking it back further. And what even, I don't understand more about that is why they even exist today. Anybody ever caught, could you fax that to me? Uh, no. Could I find a DeLorean to take me to 1995 to find a fax machine that works? I don't know what's going on there. I don't understand my wife. Complex. She understands me. Men and women, men, men are very simple. Very, you know, they've seen that picture. It's like a men, it's just an on off switch and women, it's like all these, not all this stuff going on. Like I, there's a lot I don't understand, but I do understand soldiers. I love soldiers and uh, soldiers are honest, brutally honest, right? Unless they are lying to you, right? Unless they're trying to get out of something, but they are honest and they are honest about faith. And when they don't get it, like chaplain, I don't get it. I don't understand this. I had this soldier come up to me just brutally honest and say, Chaplain, I'm a, I grew up Baptist, but um, I'm kind of Wiccan. So I'm kind of like a, a wicked Baptist kind of going on, doing my own thing. And I, and I, and I gave him the, my favorite question to ask. It's the Dr. Phil question. How's that working for you? Yeah. And the answer almost always is not too good. <laughs> That's why I'm talking to you, right? But they are absolutely honest. I want to give you a picture just to describe, if you don't know anybody in the military, just to describe what a soldier's like. Give you two examples, okay? So I was in Iraq in 2007, December 2007 to February 2009. Yes, two Christmases in the Fertile Crescent, right? Yeah, where civilization began, they invented the wheel, and then took 5,000 years off, right? Okay, so I was there, and and we had been there for a while. And once you've been there for a while, you hear rocket attacks go off. And, and when you first get there, you can always tell who just arrived, right? Because you're in the, we call it a dining facility. It's a cafeteria, right? We're in there. You hear the siren go off and all the new people are under the tables. Everybody else is like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And so we've been there for a while. We'd already passed this. You're in the gym and there are local nationals working, handing out towels, all that kind of stuff. Rocket attack happens. They run to the bunker. Everybody else, treadmill. You know, it's like this, we just kind of over it, right? And so I was there one night, it'd been about five months we'd been there. I heard a rocket, I heard a loud boom, like loud boom. And I ran into our tactical uh, operations center and my uh, so op sergeant major was there. This is one of the senior enlisted guys there. This guy had been to war a time or two. And he looked at me and he said, chaplain, get your kid on. I was like, Okay, you know, <laughs> I took his word for it. I went and got the vest on, I got the helmet on, I got the knee pads on, I got the gloves on, I got the iPro on. I run back in there, show up, and then the other sergeant major, the other senior enlisted guy had just come back from the cafeteria, from the dining facility with an ice cream cone in his hand. Looks at me, full battle rattle on and says, going to war, chaplain? You know, these are soldiers. There's like one's taking it so seriously, the other ones couldn't, couldn't care less. These, this is the people that I deal with and they are brutally honest, right? I wanna get some things straight for you. If your only encounter with the military is on TV, I gotta set you straight. Every person in the military is not a soldier, right? Soldiers are in the army. Sailors are in the Marines. Air, 
I don't know, they're in the Air Force, right? Marines are Marines are Marines, and they'll tell you, right? And nobody grows up playing Air Force, right? Think about it. We play Army. I just want to let you know that. We play Army. But our, our culture at large, we, we don't know what to do with soldiers. So World War II, come back, ticker tape parade, all of that. Hey, we won Vietnam, not so much, right? And then I think the pendulum has swung back over so now the global war on terror, I mean, it was pretty good to be a soldier. We're getting thanked and we got all this kind of stuff. But the problem was the war just lasted so long. It's like, gosh, man, you guys are still over there. Like, what is going on? We don't know what to do with soldiers. I was in Bay Ridge where I live on Fort Hamilton. If you didn't know, there is an actual army post in Brooklyn. Kind of. It's, it's kind of an army post, right? But I was in there. I was in uniform out in, um, in the uh, neighborhood. And this mom and this child walk up and this kid looks up and goes, is that a soldier? It's like, not, no, not really, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of. Um, we were, I was in uniform in Times Square and it was even worse there because people thought we were like with Super Mario and Spider-Man trying to get a picture with us, that kind of stuff. Like, you know, like we're selling them a, a mixtape or something, what was going on. Nobody knows what to do with them. But one thing about soldiers is, is true. Since 1973, Every person that served in the military did so by choice. The draft ended, we made a choice. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that, but choice is what I want to talk about today. We're going to focus on a Roman centurion, which just means he was over 100 soldiers, since like century, 100. He was over 100 soldiers, and that was a bigger deal than it is today. Today, we put lieutenants in, in charge of 100 soldiers. If you don't lieutenants, they are like the, the newest, youngest officers in the military. Okay, you've heard the saying, not all who wander are lost. The lieutenant is lost, right? And he's dangerously close to hypothermia. He is out there. This is, there was a big deal back then with the centurions. They were over 100 soldiers. It was kind of a big deal. And we're gonna see an encounter with the centurion and Jesus. Jesus has just finished the Sermon on the Mount. He's coming down and he walks up and encounters this soldier. And we're gonna, let's start with Matthew chapter eight, verses five and six. The centurion chose to love. Just like every military member chooses to serve today, but look at how this, this centurion chose to do some things. He chose to love. Matthew eight, five and six. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. This is unbelievable. If we were back in that day and saw this happen, we would not believe what we were seeing because the centurion is asking Jesus, a lowly Jew, right? In that context, Rome conquered, Rome was in charge. And he comes and asks this Jewish rabbi for help. Centurions didn't do that. They were used to telling people what to do, showing up, you know, making sure things happen, giving them the knife hand, you know, doing this and telling people what to do to make it happen. And the centurion comes and he asks Jesus for help. In those days, the emperor was the one in charge. He delegated authority. And it got delegated down and delegated down. And the centurion had some authority delegated to him. But when he showed up, he represented the emperor. And by him coming to Jesus in this way, he's showing that he knows that Jesus has the authority from God. He's been delegated the authority. He represents the Father here on earth. And he knows that Jesus has all of that power and authority. He's honestly, he's saying, hey, I know who you are, even though nobody else here does. Peter hasn't even said it yet. The disciples are clueless. The, the centurion's really saying, I know who you are. I know what's going on. You are the son of God. But he was motivated by love. He chose to love. This is completely selfless. This is very humbling. He comes to him and says, I love my servant. And some of the things I read about this, this wasn't like just a, a slave or a worker. This was someone that the centurion cared deeply about. If it was just a hired hand, he would just 
hire someone else. I don't, I don't care if you get well. I, I, I love this person, my servant, my friend is in a bad way. And I know that you can bring about healing completely selfless. He didn't come to ask Jesus for something for himself. I would have. I mean, Jesus is making tax money show up in fish's mouths, right? Remember that story? He's like, the guy's like, hey, did you pay your taxes? Jesus is like, hey, go fishing. It'll be in the mouth, right? And Jesus is showing up with a, a filet of fish value meal and feeding 5,000 people. If I were this guy, I'd be like, hey, I got a sick friend, but first, <laughs> how about a winning lotto ticket? How about that? Well, you know, I would, I would be doing something for me. It's completely selfless out of love. The centurion was loving. He chose love. What about you? What about me? Are we loving? Are we choosing love? Because love is not one of those things that just happens. We think that when those, in those first days of falling in love, it's butterflies and rainbows and unicorns and, and love just happens. After a while though, my wife can attest to this, it's hard to love me. It is a choice on the daily, right? It is a moment by moment sometimes. It is a choice to love. Are we choosing to love? Are you and I choosing love in a society that is filled with the opposite, that is filled with animosity and hate and racism and extremism and sexual assault, all of these things? Are we choosing to love? Are we living out of love? So he chose to love. Number two, the centurion chose to be humble. He chose humility. Matthew 8, 7 and 9, Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Just pause there for a second. Anytime Jesus asks a question, it's really interesting. He asks some questions, you're like, uh, duh. You're like, he asked the guy one time, he comes to him, he's sick, he's, he can't walk, like, hey, do you want to be made well? You're like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm here. You know, but, but there's always something a little deeper. So Jesus asks, shall I come and heal him? We'll get to a minute what actually happens. And the centurion replies, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. I'm a man under authority. This man had humility because he said, Jesus, I know who you are. I know you got this. Just say the word. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. You look at the other accounts. People are always, hey, come to dinner with us. We can be seen with you. So we can get something from you so we can just be near you. We had people cutting a hole in a roof and lowering friends down, trying to get something from Jesus. People as he walked, just grabbing his, his clothing, trying to get something from him. And this man says, I don't even need you to come to my house. Just say the word because I know who you are. And this took incredible humility. You know, and there's a, a tale, an account of this in the gospel of Luke as well. And in that gospel, the centurion doesn't even go to Jesus. He sends somebody else because he said, I am not worthy to even go to you. I have so much faith in you though, that I know I don't even have to lay eyes on you to believe that you can do what you say you can do. Amazing. The centurion did not want Jesus to waste his time. You don't even waste your time coming. You got a lot of stuff to do. Just say the word. It'll be done. Amazing humility. This guy had authority right? Sometimes we don't understand authority. Church folk don't understand authority a lot of times. I'm talking, talking about you. I'm not talking about you all, okay? I'm talking about churches historically, the tradition that I come from, I worked at a church for seven years, right? And so they didn't really get authority. Well, they did. They thought they all had it, right? So everybody at that church thought they had authority over everybody working at that church, right? And we were paid by their tithe money, so I guess they kind of did, right? And I said, after seven years, I'm like, God bless you, pastor. I said, I had enough of this. I'm gonna go work somewhere where taxes money pays my, my, my salary. And it does. And so thank you 
for your service. Thank you. It's all, but it's about authority. And see, we think, we get this backwards sometimes. We think sometimes we just tell God what we want, what we think he should do. Jesus, you need to do this. We get it all upside down. Jesus has the authority. This man was a great leader. He had humility. He showed love. He had the responsibility of a hundred soldiers' lives, literally lives, were in his hands. So I just recently um, got promoted, and I'm not telling you that to like, oh, I got promoted, but when I reached that rank, it really was humbling because I realized I was the same rank as the two commanders that I had in Iraq and then later in Afghanistan. And these men were responsible for a thousand soldiers, a thousand soldiers. Line. That's not just a thousand soldiers. That's a thousand. That's, that's probably five hundred spouses and probably you know soldiers we populate. So it's about like a million kids. It's like a lot, right? It was responsible for a thousand soldiers taking us to to Baghdad and then to northern Afghanistan on two different deployments, and it just blew me away. It made me so thankful that chaplains have no command authority at all. I was grateful for that. I was responsible for one soldier my chaplain assistant. And really, he was responsible for me because I couldn't carry a weapon, right? He, he was supposed to protect me, so I was just responsible for me. And I had authority, not even over myself. This man had so much authority, so many lives in his hands, and he cared about each one of them. He didn't come asking for one of his soldiers. He came asking for a servant. He cared about the lowest in his life. And he had such Humility. The centurion chose love. He chose to be humble. And he chose to be faithful. Number three, Matthew 8, 10 through 13. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following, Truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feet of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you have believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Jesus was amazed. I would dare say it would take a lot to amaze Jesus. I mean, he is kind of God and all. And he was, then he was amazed at the faith of this simple soldier. He was surprised, like, what is going on? He was surprised that this centurion had greater faith than anyone he'd encountered in all of Israel, the people that were supposed to recognize Jesus first as the Messiah. No one in Israel had this kind of faith. This is scandalous. This is something that would not be taken lightly. The Jews would have not been excited to hear this. And this is the only instance in the Bible where Jesus uses this word to describe someone. He was amazed at this soldier's faith. And the soldier was the most unlikely there is to amaze Jesus. It's because Jesus looks elsewhere than the outside. He doesn't look on the outside. In 1 Samuel, I, I, didn't, I didn't give them the scripture, but I just read it for you. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not look on the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man looks at the Instagram posts. Now, I'm not railing against Instagram. I post too, but I only post when I do things well, right? Like when I went with my kids and, we, and we, I took Anna, my little six-year-old and Parker, and we went to play in the snow, right? And we had to walk about a half a mile to get to the sledding place. And it was pouring. It was just flying in our faces. And Anna screaming, crying, I'm tired. I don't want to go. I said, be quiet. We're going to the hill. And I had to drag her up there. And she felt in it. But then I took a picture. All smiles, right? We didn't talk about everything that led up to that, right? Nobody posts their behind the scenes stuff online. We're just not that honest. Like I only post on Wordle when I get it on the second guest, right? And if you do that, you post it, and people just forget. And they go, man, that, he's pretty smart. He's always posting. He's getting like on the second, first, first second guess. Tip for the tip for you out there, right? God does not look at that. He's not impressed by that outward stuff, but we get tied up into that. We see people 
live their lives and all they and all they post and all I post are the good things, the positive things, the uplifting things, all those times when I had faith. Which mics? There we go. Train of thought left the station. There we go. So we, we only post about, about things that are, are going well like when we have faith. I mean, God answered this prayer. I was added faith, I had faith. And I was talking to my wife the other day. I was like, do you see these people and their kids and they're doing all this kind of stuff? And like, man, do they ever struggle? And she's like, yeah, they just don't put it online. So I'm here to tell you, if you struggle in life, if you have a hard time believing, if you have a hard time loving, if you have a hard time with humility, if you have a hard time with faithfulness, welcome to the club. You're in good, you're in good, uh, it's good to have you here, right? There's more seats, there's more people out there, right? There, this is a place for those who struggle. And, and like as Paul says, I, I'm the chief of these. I struggle with it all the time. Verse 13, I love this. He said, Jesus just says, go, go. Jesus is sounding like the soldier now. He gets the last word. God gets the final word and Jesus says, go. And at that moment, the servant was healed. Jesus says, go, it's done. He gets the final word. Let me give you a little, a little thing. If you're watching movies and people are on the radio in, uh, in the military stuff, they'll use the phonetic alphabet like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Um, but but they'll, they'll, you hear them say, over and out. Have you ever heard that? Over and out. Here's a little tip. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. They'll say over when they're done talking so the next person can talk. And then the highest ranking person, the commander, will say out when the conversation is over. <laughs> but sir, I got more to say. Out, right? Jesus is essentially saying out, go. The conversation's over. It's done. I see your faith. It is finished. He is healed. Billy Graham said once that God will not reward fruitfulness, but he will reward faithfulness. And I think fruitfulness is often the reward for faithfulness. You are faithful and little, you'll be given more. You're faithful, fruit will be produced. But God, that's, God doesn't reward. He's not looking for like all the highlights. He's not looking for you to do all this kind of stuff. He's looking for you and me to be faithful in what he's called us to do. The centurion was faithful. Are we faithful? Are you faithful? Am I faithful? The takeaway today, loving, humble, faithful. When Jesus encounters you, what does he encounter? What kind of person does he find? Does he find a loving person? Does he find a humble person? Does he find a faithful person? So I understand soldiers. I'm here to tell you, you do too. Because they are just like you and me. They make heroic choices and they make horrible choices, just like us. We, we act out of bravery and courage and then we act out of fear and faithlessness. And I find myself vacillating between the two almost daily. There's nothing special about this soldier or any soldier, just like, they're just like us. Special in the fact that we are loved by God, created in his image, but not so that we are above anything else. We're just regular people living our lives. And if we do it the way the centurion did, we will we'll find fruitfulness. We'll find joy. We'll find peace. So this story is not really about Jesus' encounter with the centurion. It's about what happened before it and what happened after. Before it, the centurion found out about Jesus and he believed. He came to Jesus asking for healing. He got healing. Now what happens next? Well, it's, we don't know. It's a great thing about the Bible. I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. What happens next for you? What happens next for me? Well, here's what happens next. We have to choose to love everyone except maybe Putin. Okay, okay. We have to love. We have to choose love. We have to love those that are unlovable, especially those that are unlovable. Who is that person in your life that you just find a hard time loving? 
that may be the person that God is calling you to love the most. Matthew 5, 43 and 44, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you. And we think, you know, they're just haters are going to hate, people are persecuting me. I don't think we're not, we're not really there yet. I think we're talking about just those people in your lives that are just difficult to love. Just difficult to love. Who is God calling you to love? And it may be yourself. Sometimes our own, our own internal, our own soul, our own selves are the hardest people to love because we believe the lies that have been said about us and said to us. And we don't believe the truth of who Christ says we are. Because if Christ died for you and for me, then I would say we're worth a pretty high price, pretty high value. So maybe the unlovable person in your life that God is telling you to love is you. Who is it that God is calling you to love? So we've got to choose to love, and it's a choice. It does not happen automatically. We've also got to choose to be humble. We can remain humble by being curious. As this patron saint of positivity, Ted Lasso says, be curious, not judgmental. And that is something I have it on my thing at work. I have it like right above my computer at work so I can remember because work, I'm here to tell you, makes me want to judge people. I'm Matt and I judge people, right? There's a, there's a pastor online that I follow and he has this huge tattoo and it says, only God can judge me. I'm like, no, that's not true. I'm judging you right now and that's a horrible tattoo, right? That, but I want to be curious and curiosity only comes with humility, because if I'm not humble, I think I've got it all figured out. But if I remain curious and I just ask questions, I can get to know somebody. I can get to know myself. I can get to know my neighbor. I can get to know Jesus better because we've never arrived. We think we, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. It feels like I'm just at the start, right? It's all about humility. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. I would say, humble yourselves before the Lord before he has to humble you. Because that is painful, right? <laughs> Much more painful than humbling yourself. We've got to choose humility. I tell you, um, so my job, I, I work for the chief of chaplains here in New York. It's a really weird job. It's really cool. But my last job, the Army sent me to get a master's in marriage and family therapy. And I'm thinking, I love education. Like, if the Army's going to pay for a degree. I will get the degree. So I did that, and then I was a therapist in the Army for two and a half years. I'm very curious, right? <laughs> so people come to me, and after a while, I thought, I've heard this before. Yeah, 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 I know. You, you just do this, do this, do this. And I thought I would never be surprised. Kind of like Jesus was amazed. I would be just shocked. Like, Whoa, that, that came out of left field. I had no idea that you would tell me that right now. We do not know what's going on in people's lives. And if we would make ourselves humble, we'd humble ourselves and be curious. Um, we don't know what struggle people are going through. Those people that are really hard to love, there's probably a reason that they're really hard to love. They're probably going through something that we have no idea about. We've got to remain humble and curious. And finally, we've got to choose to be faithful. Choose to believe, especially when there is no reason to believe. You may look at your life in a situation that you're in and you say, I see no way out of this. There is absolutely no way this is going to get better. I have no faith at all. That is the exact moment that you got to have faith, right? You've got to believe in spite of what everything looks like, in spite of what you see. Because in the economy of Jesus, believing is seeing. It's not the other way around. Now, I'm not saying that God won't do a miracle in your life and give you, like, if you just, like, uh, Gideon, put the, the, the wool out there, let it be wet, let it be dry, show me, a, give me a sign, God. God has done that in my life, definitely. But there have been times in my life when I've gone through what felt like the valley of the shadow of death, 
And I had absolutely no reason in my mind or in my field of vision, in the physical world, I had no reason to have faith. And those were the times that God showed me, I am all you really have, and I am all you really need, and I love you, and you are mine, and I've got this. Now, that doesn't mean, <laughs> well, we, we made some horrible financial decisions early in our marriage, probably the first half of our marriage at this point. And we cried out to God when we, came, when we realized the error of our ways. We cried out, God, help us. And he said, I will help you. And four years later, we were debt free, right? It was not like, like that. We had to walk through that. But in that, I realized that God truly is all that I have. He truly is all that I need. And I must believe because there is no other option. We have to choose to be faithful. Francis Chan says, true faith means holding nothing back. It means putting every hope in God's fidelity to his promises. God is faithful. We could go around this room. I could guarantee everyone could say, God is faithful faithful in my life. He, he came through. And maybe it didn't work out exactly how I thought it was going to, but it worked out the way that God chose to work it out. And he had my back. He goes before me, behind me, beside me. He is, he's in the future. He's in the past. He's in the present. He is everywhere. And he is concerned with you and with me. And there's absolutely nothing in your life that he does not care about. He cares about it all. The little the big, he cares about it all. What specific area of your life, what specific thing, what struggle are you in the midst of now that is requiring faith? Ask God, he will give it. As I, as I wrap up, there's a quote that I want you to remember that I, that I love, and, and it was from one of my favorite seminary professors, and he would always say at the end of class, um, have a good day if you want to. There's a lot of truth to that because life is about choices. If I can say, have a, have a lot of love if you want to. Be humble if you want to. Be faithful if you want to because the choice is yours and mine. We all have choices to make every day. Someone here today may need to make the choice, the decision, the commitment to follow Christ, to trust Jesus with your life. And I'm going to give you the opportunity. If that's you, I want you to just, I'll, I'll, let's all just close our eyes. Let's close our eyes. I'll pray out loud. You can pray in your heart. You can pray aloud. But if if the Holy Spirit has been moving in your life in this service, the Holy Spirit didn't just start today. The Holy Spirit has been drawing. You're not here by accident in this room, in this city, at this time. There's no coincidence. It's not an accident. The Holy Spirit has been drawing you. And maybe he's been drawing you because you do not have a relationship with him. You have not trusted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. If that's you, I want to give you the opportunity. And that's not just a prayer, we'll pray. That's just the beginning. What happens next is what's important. And we'll help you through that. So let's pray. Jesus, I love you. I know that I am a sinner. I know I have missed the mark. And there is absolutely no way that I could fix this mess that I've made on my own. I don't have the power, and I'm so tired of trying. So I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and my Savior. You are the only one who died for my sins, who rose from the grave, who sends His Holy Spirit to reside inside of me. So I ask you today, as a sinner in need of a Savior, I confess, please come into my life and be my Redeemer, my Lord, my Savior, my Master. 
Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know you, that they would come to know you. And they would find community among this body of believers from across this city, from across the world, who've gathered here in this great city that we all call home. May we be the body that goes out into this world and shares love and forgiveness that you have to offer. I ask this in the strong and kind name of Jesus. Amen.